Hello, I'm Alexis Wright and welcome to episode three of Signposts, Stories for Our Fragile Times, a new web series presented by the State Library of Victoria and the University of Melbourne's Faculty of Arts. I would first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge them and traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. My guest today is Melissa Lukashenko. Melissa is a prize winning author from the Bunjalung people of the Northern Coastal area of New South Wales. In 1992, Melissa was a founding member of Sisters Inside, an organisation which supports women and girls in prison. She also holds an honours degree in public policy from Griffith University. Melissa writes adult literary fiction, literary non-fiction, and has also written novels for teenagers. Her novels include Steam Pigs, Killing Darcy, Hard Yards, Two Flash, Mullumbimby, and Too Much Lip. In 2013, Melissa won a Walkley Award for her essay, Sinking B Below Sight, Down and Out in Brisbane and Logan. Melissa, thank you so much for joining me for a conversation today from Brisbane. Uh, Boogle Bay, Jim Malone. My hmm. pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, it's a long time since we've had a good conversation. We've talked many times over the years and um, in different places. We were at a writer's festival in London together and uh, you were staying with me um, at my house uh, for the night in Alice Springs when 9-11 happened in 2001 mm -hmm. and we sat um, glued to the TV most of the night just watching it all unfold and just a mm -hmm. uh, shock. We talked together with Alice Walker in Sydney. It was fantastic and it was just a you know, thrill for us to be there with Alice Walker, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been at Byron Bay Writers Festival together and again at the Dreamtime Festival. A lot of uh, ground we've covered over the years. Now you won a, a number of literary awards and last year you won the most pre prestigious literary award in the country for your novel, Too Much Lip. I'm really interested in um, that creative process and uh, how you came up with the, you know, that idea to write the, this book based around the, you know, the Slater family, uh, Kerry, Ken, Donnie, Black Superman, great name, and Donna, <laughs> and uh, a grandmother, Pretty Mary. And then this place uh, in fictional Northern Coast, New South Wales, uh, Durongo. But I also thought it was a really complicated book to, to write. There's a lot of, characters there's so much happening in that in that family and the relationships that you know with in the town and and just talk a little bit about where that idea came from you know of of writing this book yeah thanks um alexis and i'd also like to pay my respects to the Tarabal and yagara peoples whose land i'm sitting on today and where i've been working most of uh, the last few years when i'm not down on country close to nimba as you would know alexis any novel has uh many you know geneses what's that saying um success has many fathers <laughs> and failures and orphan <laughs> but uh the the idea for too much lip in a way sprang out of um when we did that thing with alice walker uh it was either 2013 or 2014 and because i was interviewing her uh and you i went and i read her first novel which is the third life of um, Grange Copeland, I think. And it's a it's an intergenerational family saga of black sharecroppers in the American South. So post-slavery, but people with great poverty and great trauma to work through. And it's it's a book with similarities to The Colour Purple, but it was her very first book. And I read it because of that saying that um, uh, writers often write the same book again and again. And so I thought if I went to her first novel, I'd, I'd know where she was really coming from and the best way to interview her. And so I read this terrific intergenerational novel and I thought, this is something that I can do in an Australian context. I can write about our circumstances and our pain uh, through the, you know, the um, vehicle of an intergenerational story. Mm. Uh, but I knew that... Um, 
for my audience and for my own voice. It had to be a funny story. Mm. Uh, I wasn't interested in adding to the the trauma of our of my readers, um, particularly my black readers. So I decided that I would write a funny book that took trauma seriously. It is funny, and uh, you know, I really like this line. You know, um, you know, which uh, Pretty Mary said it, you know, it was uh, you know her birthday party. You know, things were coming together and uh, for the family in the way that she saw it. And, uh, <laughs> and she said, it was some kind of ancestral miracle. I kind of feel this book is too. It's a, it's a kind of ancestral miracle. I love it. And uh, Well, I owe you a debt. Well, you did so well. Yes. Because at, at Byron Festival in 2007, it must have been, or 2006, you mm -hmm. said to me it was time for me to write another book. And out of that, I got the kick along that I needed to write uh, Mullumbimby. Mm -hmm. And uh, after Mullumbimby, Too Much Less was like the next yeah. cab off the rank. So no, thanks for that. that no, no worries. <laughs> and um, um, at that stage, I think you needed to... Um, we needed to have that good talk and you you, mm. you needed you needed that yeah, yeah, yeah. and to get back into it and and it's paid off it's it's terrific mm. now you um won the miles franklin last year i did <laughs> look I, I, it's it's such a big thing to happen to you know any any author i was just wondering if you could tell me you know you know about when you you know, were awarded that prize. How did you feel? And... Couldn't believe my ears. Uh, Murray Waldron rang me up, mm -hmm. and I, I'd looked up who the judges were, but it was just several weeks earlier, and I'd forgotten basically who the judges were. Yeah. And then I got the phone call, and Murray Waldron's name came up on my phone. I thought, oh, he's he's a literary critic or something academic, and uh, I think he's one of the judges. But I, I just figured he was right, ringing me up to ask me to write an article or something. And so yeah, right. <laughs> you know something like it gives me great pleasure to tell you you've won and I, I just said oh bugger me dead <laughs> <laughs> compute for a while like, yeah. it, it, uh, are you sure you know what <laughs> and it didn't it took a while to go in and um I you know it's it's a stupid saying but I really can die happy now I was in a siege last year yeah there's more uni there was um uh I was giving a talk at the Aboriginal unit at Lismore Uni and uh, all of a sudden these sirens went off and the intercom, the uni intercom started going, beep, 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 you know, attention, attention, do not move from where you are. And so for a couple of hours, we were all locked in the Aboriginal unit thinking that there were two gunmen loose on campus because that's what was on being reported. And it turned out to be a... a um, a real threat but there weren't guys on campus there was a, an actual threatening incident but like so anyway the the point of the story is that for those two hours mm. i barricaded myself in a room without windows and thought i might well die and what that taught me was um i'm actually i have achieved what i wanted to achieve as an individual in my life you know for my kids my family I've done what I can in my community. And I think having won the Miles Franklin was a small part of that too. So, you know, it's a facetious saying to say that you can die happy, but I actually discovered that I could. Did it keep you busy all this? Yeah, lots and lots of requests for, you mm. know, interviews, articles, go here, go there. I yep. was meant to go to China in about April, I think, and mm -hmm. it was um, a real shame that COVID meant that couldn't happen. And I've met a um, a Chinese translator who's going to translate too much lip into Mandarin. Good. And it's also been sold internationally to the US and UK markets. So that's, um, although that publisher did say that they were interested before it won the miles. So, but yeah, it takes it up a notch for sure. But I just wonder if you talk about the, the writing process. I have this study here, which I can give you a glimpse of in suburban Mianjin, Brisbane. Uh, that's where I do a lot of my writing. I also do a lot of writing in the bush in Northern Rivers. There's a cabin down there without electricity or internet, so it's easy to concentrate there until my um, laptop battery dies <laughs> and then I have to go and scrounge some electricity off the neighbours. Uh, I write in a recliner because I've got a bad back. When I go to work, I literally get to lie in a, a lazy boy recliner. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, you said something about the whip birds making waking you up. Yeah, we're well, down at um, the cabin. Uh, wake up in the morning. There's all sorts of birds. You know the um, the magpies and the kookaburras, of course. But there's other little rainforest birds that I haven't learnt to identify yet. Mm. But then about breakfast time, the whip bird will start singing out, you know, choo choo yep. and it's like, okay, cracking the whip, time to get to work and stop mucking around. This signpost series to give, um, designed to give writers a chance to, to reflect on the times we're living in, times of global warming, global pandemic, global inequalities, you know, Black Lives Matter movement. I was wondering if uh, you can talk about a little bit what you think literature could do, you know, in times like these. I think that's one of the things about being a creative writer is that you you only rarely get insight into how your work affects people. You know, you and I go to festivals and people come up to us and say, you know, you wrote such and such or you said such and such and it changed my thinking or I've always remembered you saying this or that. And so we do get that direct feedback and that's really great and gratifying. But I guess in the larger landscape, um, it can feel like shouting into a void but I was reflecting on it recently and um, someone or another said do you think the landscape in Australian literature is changing and the way you're read in Australia mm. and I thought about that and you know I've been writing for about 23 or 24 years seriously now and my writing has improved over that time but it hasn't improved so much to account for the difference in the way my work is received now to how it was received in the late 1990s. And so I think that means that the readership is developing and, you know, all of us, it's a cumulative effort, you know, it's not mm. what Melissa Lukashenko is writing, it's what you and I and Tony Birch and Tara June Winch and Romaine Morton and Anita Heiss and Kim Scott and Uncle Bruce Pascoe, mm. all of us, everyone all around the country is writing, mm. you know, Charmaine Paper Talk Green, Melody Munungur, mm. we're all, um, it's not one, it's, it's a voice, but it's a voice with many parts. And I guess I feel like we have made a difference. You know, Tara's just picked up the miles this year. Mm -hmm. I won last year and I just saw on my Facebook before I came online here is that Lisa Fuller has won a big award for her um, young adult novel, mm -hmm. Ghost Bird. Mm -hmm. And so I think things are changing. I think it's, it's slow. And I still think we have to be, you know, better and smarter and work harder uh, than mainstream writers to be heard and to um, make a difference but yeah I think I'm starting to think we are that's in terms of Aboriginal writing in terms of the the situation of the world um, you know in in a world where Kanye West and Donald Trump are being spoken of seriously as presidents of the US uh, it's really difficult to know what to think except you keep putting one foot in front of the other and you do what you can do in your local community and you keep the faith. Yeah. You got any uh, thoughts about stories that, uh, you know, we might be needing in the future? Um, Uncle Victor Hart was talking to me. Um, he's Cape York man who lives in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. And he was um, reminding me the other day about uh, Leslie Marmon Silco's story where there's a storytelling competition and everyone gets around and tells their different yarns and then someone tells a yarn that's so powerful and so grim and so dark and it's about the end of the world and the apocalypse and mm. and terror and horror mm. and the people judging the competition say yes yes you win but this is a very hard story it's a very difficult dangerous story mm. take it back and the person said no it's out there now. You can't take it back. Once it's said, it's said. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's a imperative to be mindful about what we're putting out there, what stories we're allowing into the world. Give my best wishes to uh, Victor when you talk Hello. to him next. Yes, yeah. he um, made it possible for a very good um, uh, um, launch of Carpenteria at mm -hmm. the Brisbane Writers Festival a long time ago. Uh, yeah. When uh, I couldn't uh, you know, the, nobody, well, the Rose Festival itself wasn't really interested in launching Carpenteria and Victor came along and made it all possible. Yeah. Murray came down and, and 
and um, uh, Jackie Katona also launched the book as well. It was it was full up. The, the whole market was full up with uh, married people from all over Brisbane. It was yeah. just phenomenal, yeah. amazing. That's it. Thanks to Victor, Melissa. I was wondering if you, you had any advice to give to young writers in Australia. I think I'm getting older because I could give people advice till the bloody uh, cows come home these days. <laughs> <laughs> A few years ago, I probably wouldn't have, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't have offered any. Uh, be brave, mm. you know, be brave. The truth has a, a quality in it that will protect you. You know, it was frightening to write Too Much Lip. Yeah. Uh, less so Mullumbimby, but Too Much Lip, it... Uh, yeah, that's a big book. <laughs> I thought... Um, you know, no guts, no glory. And I didn't write it for glory. I actually thought the book would sink like a stone. I didn't mm. expect it to do well, especially when it was, um, I don't think it was shortlisted for the New South Wales Fiction Prize. And I thought, oh, well, you know, people don't like this stuff. It's it's too hard and uh, it's not the right moment for it. But as it turned out, it was the right moment for it. But I spent two years um, really frightened as I was writing that book. I thought I'd get ripped. Uh, left, right, and centre. Yeah. Not from white people, that doesn't worry me in the slightest, but from my own mob. And instead, what I've gotten is is floods of Aboriginal women and some men saying, mm. "Yes, this is my life. Uh, everything in this book is exactly um, what I can relate to." And also, people telling me that's really funny and a great yarn. The longer I write and the more um, developed I become as a writer, the more I realise it's important uh, what I read and reflect upon in mm. my writing and so, and also to be conscious of it, I guess. And so I was really conscious of the Alice Walker novel when I was writing Too Much Lip. Yeah. And in the current book that I'm writing, which has a 100-year-old protagonist, I'm... Uh, drawing heavily on, well, not drawing heavily, I'm influenced heavily by The Secret Scripture, which is an Irish novel by Sebastian Barry that I think is okay. an absolutely fabulous book. You know, and I'm reading lots of history. I'm reading lots of colonial fiction. Mm. Um, I'm, yeah, this, it's like the, the richer the mix that you put in, mm. the more resources you have That's right. stored up inside you when it comes to actually write your own work hey that's that's it yeah the best teachers are um, are the writers of other books i think mm. the best yeah, i'm loving it you know the mm. first drafts are hard i don't know about you yeah. some writers prefer the first drafts to the actual rewriting but not me yeah oh no no it's it's good what's what's uh, uh what, what what the problem really is is the blank page when you start yeah yeah that's, that's right yeah yeah, and then you start, and you just carry on. Go, you go, go. You know, you right, 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 and then you know you can't use any of it, and uh, you start again. Yeah, see, I don't cut a lot. I, I. That's part of what blocks me sometimes is that I, I'm too lazy to want to write thousands and thousands of words and know that I have to get rid of them. So I, yeah. I did cut seventeen thousand words out of Mullumbimby, but too mm -hmm. much. I probably only cut maybe five or six or seven thousand in total because yeah. I um yeah I just I prefer to do the cutting before I write almost in a way my books seem to take a long time because of, of, mm. of life and a whole lot of reasons but the yeah. more the more the longer it takes the longer it gets the book because I'm thinking about the book the whole time and so things change all the time, all the time. So it just yeah, becomes yeah, a bigger yeah. book. So if you ever wonder why I write such big books, is that <laughs> that's the reason because they take so long, and and, uh, and I'm thinking about it so much. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have my basic plot, and then I've just come out of the phase now where I've turned that basic plot into a very detailed synopsis, yeah. and I'll I won't make it any more any longer than it, I've already got it in terms of the synopsis it's um it's like i've made myself a box and the novel will now happen inside that box with the ingredients that i've got that's that's my usual way um, but yeah making the box that's the bloody hard work yeah. that's good yeah
Well, mine's a bit looser. It's a, yeah. I think I, I described it once as a rickety building that, you know, it's, you, you're the engineer and it can fall yeah. down at any, any, any time, at any moment. And yeah. uh, feels like that. Together. <laughs> that's, that's um, some other good advice for young writers actually is it's not meant to be easy. You know, it's not meant to be simple or straightforward. It's if it feels hard and feels impossible, mm. uh, that's all part of the process. Sometimes. That's, part of, that's part of the challenge and that's what it's all about. Yeah. Melissa, it's been really good talking to you today. We've um, gone through this very, very quickly. And, but uh, I know that you've selected, I think, two pieces that you will go to read. Yeah. I've selected a piece that I often read, which is the crow scene from the beginning. And um, I've also selected a scene between Kerry and Steve from later in the book. Okay, so this is when Kerry Salter is, has just returned to her hometown in northern New South Wales. Three wark flapped down onto the road beside her, drawn to the flattened remains of a King Brown, which looked to have lost a fight with Scruffy McCarthy's cattle truck. The birds stared at Kerry, cawing obnoxiously before they turned to their snake and ripped it in half. The biggest crow seized the open-jawed front end and hopped with glee to the grassy verge. Hungry, it plunged hard into the rotting head, seeking out the reptile's soft brain and then looked up, baffled. The fanged snake's skull had gotten wedged hard onto the bird's beak. The crow shook its head, first in surprise and then in anger, but to no avail. Kerry watched fascinated and appalled. Would the crow manage to free itself? Or would the mandulin have the last grim laugh, its hard, tiny skull locking the crow's beak shut until the birds starved to death? The eaters and the eaten of Durongo having it out at the crossroads. You don't see old mate Freddie McCubbin painting that, do you? Talk about doubt on his fucking luck. <laughs> The other crows noticed their companion's plight. Ha <laughs> ha, looks like a mutant, half a bird and half a snake, mocked the one on the left. Are you stuck? asked the other one, falling about with delight at its own wit. I'm not the only one in Durongo plagued by assholes. then, Kerry noted. You can mowle down. What are we a gully? The luckless crow complained. My beak's no good. You could help a bird. Kerry looked around the deserted road. Yugum bawgul jang, boyala gali, yugum yan mugul guri brisbanyu. You could help instead of sitting up there like a mug left from the city. Kerry looked around again. The wag hopped up and down in rage. Then the second crow chimed in, dripping scorn. It's no good to ya, fang face. Can't talk lingo. Can't even find its way home. Turned right at the Cal River when it should have kept going straight. It's as moodle as you look. How the hell do you lot know where I've been? Kerry retorted. Back in town five minutes and the bloody wildlife keeping tabs on her already. <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> People love those crows. It's funny because that's one of the um, scenes that the publisher wasn't entirely sure of. Oh, really? The crows was a bit uh, a bit out there for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got cr oh, crows uh, as well in, in, in some of my work. Mm. Mm, mm. All right, this is a scene between Kerry and Steve on page 180 mm -hmm. where Kerry has just been booted out by her mother um, and she's uh, homeless essentially. Christ, you remember Pretty Mary's basically booted me out, Kerry asked him. Kerry M. Salter, unwanted in every state of the union. Hey, don't make me the bad guy. You're asking me to risk everything I've got. Kerry put her face in her hands. Typical. She should have just lied, told him she was madly in love, ready to make babies, all the shit that men wanted to hear. Given the arse from two houses in 24 hours, that was some kind of record. There were flop places she could crash, but they weren't exactly safe. And she wasn't up for the kind of crap addicts always had going on anyway. The lying, the violence, the madness. 
Uncle Richard's place, maybe, but his maddening stepson who never shut up about his university crap was there. Oh, no, God, she'd end up stabbing him, true as God. Girl, Kerry told herself, you fucked things up well and good this time. Could it have only been last October that she was shopping at Logan Central Plaza with Ali, talking about buying tickets to Mardi Gras? That was another century, another life, another fucking dimension. Kerry drained her coffee cup, put it on the floor beside the mattress and watched the last brown drops slide smoothly to the bottom, pooling there, down, down, down. I feel like a fucking idiot, Kez, Steve told her, his bottom lip dragging their laugh. Oh, Christ, a wave of guilt crashed over Kerry and she touched his shoulder. Well, don't. I think you're great, but... Oh, right. But, Steve interrupted sarcastically, putting inverted commas around the words with his fingers. Kerry soldiered on. Let me finish. Growing up, I didn't worry that much about colour. Us Durango kids just stuck together. Then I hit Pado High. That was bad enough. I know, Steve interrupted. I was there, remember? Yeah, but you weren't there long and you weren't the target, were you? Anyway, then Donna went missing in grade nine and no white cunt in Durango shy gave a shit. Think about that for a second. The Paddo cops laughed at us, reckoned she'd just gone walkabout with some bloke in a Mitsubishi Magna. The dog eyes she was drinking with that day didn't give a rat's ass. I had to lie in bed at 14 and hear mum cry herself to sleep and wonder where in the hell my big sis had gone if she was alive or dead. And then when Dad had his heart attack a few months later, I thought, fuck them all, stick to your own kind. Until now, I always have. So Kerry spread her arms wide. So here we are, nothing simple or easy. She pulled on her jeans as Steve watched, the ground between his feet turning to a quagmire as the truth dawned. So after everything, I'm still some kind of enemy? Steve was incredulous, then angry. All those jokes you like to make about white fellas, they aren't jokes at all, are they? Kerry shrugged and looked away. Dugos had no idea, no fucking clue what was at stake when you walked out into the world wrapped in dark skin. And if you told them the truth, it was always boo-hoo, poor me. I'm going for a ride, Kerry told him, picking up her keys. Any doubt? Clear the fuck out. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks mate. You're fantastic. Thank you. You're brilliant. Yeah, I had good teachers like you. Yeah, no, nah, you're an ancestor miracle. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Boogle bear, boogle bear, nanang. <laughs>